You can easily fact check the information in this film by going to abuse-of-power.org and entering the numbers you will see in the upper right corner during the film into the fact check box at the upper right corner of the website, or by looking in the site's document archive when you see DA instead of a number during the film. From 1996 to 1998, these three foreign nationals trained at the Pensacola Naval Air Station. Military records show that the three used 10 Radford Boulevard as their address. This is a base roadway on which residences for foreign military flight trainees are located. These men are Saeed Al Ghamdi, Ahmed Al Nami, and Ahmed Al Ghamdi, alleged hijackers of Flight 75 and 93. Why were three of the alleged hijackers from 9 11 trained at a U.S. Navy flight school? March 1999. German officials gave the CIA this man's first name and phone number in the United Arab Emirates. On 9-11, Marwan al-Shihi allegedly crashed Flight 175 into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. Why was someone who was on our intelligence services radar for over two years allowed into the U.S.? September 1999, a report for the National Intelligence Council warned that suicide bombers belonging to Al-Qaeda's martyrdom battalion could crash land an aircraft packed with high explosives into the Pentagon, the headquarters of the Central Intelligence Agency, or the White House. Why were we told that no one could have foreseen terrorists using planes the way they did on 9-11 when the U.S. was warned two years before by the National Intelligence Council that Al-Qaeda could be planning to crash a plane into the Pentagon? January 15, 2000. Nawaf Hazmi and Khalid Amadar entered the U.S., the CIA was first made aware of them that same month when they showed up at a Qaeda summit in Malaysia. March 2000, CIA headquarters received information that Nawaf al-Hazmi entered the United States. September 2000, they moved into the home of a tested undercover asset working with the FBI office in San Diego. Both Nawaf al-Hazmi and Khalid al-Madar allegedly hijacked Flight 77 over a year later. Why was no effort made by the CIA to locate these men after they were aware of their presence in this country? And why were they living with a tested undercover asset of the FBI? June 3rd, 2000, Mohammed Atta entered the country on a multiple entry tourist visa. August 29th, 2000, Marwan al Shihi, the man that the CIA knew about for over a year, entered the U.S. on a tourist visa. September 2000, a neoconservative think tank called the Project for New American Century, the membership of which consists of people such as Dick Cheney, Jeb Bush, Louis Libby, Donald Rumsfeld, and Paul Wolfowitz, published a report called Rebuilding America's Defenses. Here they talk about how the U.S. needs to fight and win multiple simultaneous major theater wars to establish our military dominance, and how it would be a long process absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. January 3rd, 2001. Al-Shihi and Atta finished their flight course more than six months before their student visas were approved. January 10th, 2001. Atta is interrogated by INS inspectors after he mentioned taking flight lessons on the tourist visa. On 9-11, Muhammad Atta allegedly flew Flight 11 into the World Trade Center. If the CIA had acted when they received al-Shihi's name from German officials, they could have connected him to Atta. January 25, 2001. Richard A. Clark sent Condoleezza Rice this memo in which he states that we urgently need a principal-level review of the Al-Qaeda network. January 30, 2001. Zayed Jarrah was questioned after he spent six months in the U.S. learning to fly. The CIA suspected that he had been in Afghanistan and wanted to question him because of his suspected involvement in terrorist activities. On 9-11, Zayed Jarrah allegedly crashed Flight 93 into a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. April 2001, officials at NORAD wanted to develop a response in the event that a terrorist group would use an airliner as a missile to attack the Pentagon, but the Joint Chiefs of Staff rejected the scenario as too unrealistic. Why was what seems to be the same exercise that had been deemed too unrealistic being done on 9-11, causing confusion as to whether the hijackings were real-world or just a part of the exercise? June 1st, 2001, 
Vice Admiral S.A. Fry signed Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Instruction 3610.018, the purpose of which is to provide guidance in the event of an aircraft piracy or hijacking. This prohibited military personnel from participating in the search, seizure, arrest, or apprehension of aircraft hijackers, or use of military aircraft, fixed wing or helicopter, or other vehicles as platforms for gunfire, or the use of other weapons against suspected hijackers. Why would our government prohibit our military from participating in the search, seizure, arrest, or apprehension of aircraft hijackers, including the use of pretty much any kind of weapon against them? And why was it done just two months before 9-11? July 2001. Khalid al-Madar is issued a new visa, even though the CIA had linked him to a suspected bomber of the USS Cole in October of 2000. July 4, 2001, Osama bin Laden went to an American hospital in Dubai where he met a CIA official. He arrived in Dubai on July 4 by air and was immediately taken to the hospital for kidney treatment, even though he had been one of the FBI's ten most wanted fugitives since June 1999, he was allowed to leave. July 10, 2001, Phoenix FBI agent Kenneth Williams wrote a memo to his superiors in Washington and New York City suggesting that terrorists might be learning to fly in U.S. flight schools. He asked for a check of flight schools, saying that it was more than a coincidence that Osama bin Laden supporters were attending the schools, but no checks were made. July 26, 2001. CBS News reported that Attorney General Ashcroft was traveling exclusively by leased jet aircraft instead of commercial airlines due to what the Justice Department called a threat assessment by the FBI and said Ashcroft has been advised to travel only by private jet for the remainder of his term. August 2001. A Moroccan Secret Service agent that successfully infiltrated Al-Qaeda for two years broke cover to warn that the terror group was plotting something spectacular and that it would be a large-scale operation in New York in the summer or autumn of 2001. August 6, 2001. Britain gave President Bush a categorical warning to expect multiple airline hijackings by the Al-Qaeda network. The British warning of Al-Qaeda plans to hijack U.S. airliners was contained in a briefing sent to Bush a month before the attacks on the World Trade Center in the Pentagon. August 2001. Al-Madar had given a false address on his visa application and could not be found. A FBI agent asked for assistance from FBI headquarters, but was denied. He wrote back on August 29th, Someday someone will die, especially since the biggest threat to us now, Osama bin Laden, is getting the most protection. August 31st, 2001. Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak warned the U.S. that something would happen. He added, We expected that something was going to happen and inform the Americans. We told them. September 7, 2001. The U.S. Department of State issued a public announcement that stated, We are concerned about information we received in May 2001 that American citizens may be the target of a terrorist threat from extremist groups with links to Osama bin Laden's Al-Qaeda organization. As always, we take this information seriously. September 9, 2001. The North American Aerospace Defense Command deployed fighter aircraft to forward operating locations in Alaska and northern Canada. We were told this limited our response capability, but we know from reading the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Instruction 3610.01A that it would not have made any difference if there was an F-16 available to do a shoot-down because that instruction prohibits it as of June 1, 2001. September 10, 2001. Senior U.S. intelligence officials said that the National Security Agency intercepted two messages warning that something was going to happen the next day, but the messages were not translated until September 12th. Why, with all the information our government had, only a small portion of which was presented here, did the events of 9-11 take place? Our government has told us that it was due to agencies such as the CIA and the FBI not sharing the intelligence they had gathered. This brings us to other questions. Why, if all we needed to stop 9-11 was to have the CIA and FBI share their intel, did the U.S. instead pass the Patriot Act, start doing warrantless wiretaps, reading our mail, and monitoring our email and internet activity? And why is the Department of Homeland Security giving out money to establish networks of security cameras on city streets?